this is episode 2 of Amos chapter 1, and I've broken it up into chapter 1a and chapter 1b. So here's Amos. He was active circa 760 to 753 BC, just seven years in total, and he preached during the rules of uh, reigns of King Uzziah, which is here, who reigned for 52 years in Judah, and Jeroboam II, who reigned for 41 years. And so the reigns of the two kings overlapped by 15 years. And the north and the south were at the zenith of their power. They experienced national stability, prosperity, and the expansion of their kingdoms. So who is the prophet Amos? So Amos was a rancher and sheep breeder of southern Judah in the town of Tekoa, about 12 miles southeast of Jerusalem. He was also a grower of sycamore figs, which were not native to that region. In his community, he was a wealthy and respected man with a heart for the oppressed and anyone who suffered injustice. He was not a professional prophet. He didn't earn his living with this ministry, nor was he even a priest or of noble birth. He was also the only prophet in the Old Testament that describes his occupation before God called him. He was well educated and must have been successful because he could afford to take seven years off from ranching and farming to preach to the north. But although he was a southerner from Judah, God had him prophesying in the north against the north to warn the people against their worship of false gods and unrepented ways. So as a southerner, he was not well received. Now remember in the Bible, Israel is also called the northern kingdom and is also called Ephraim because Ephraim was the biggest and the most powerful tribe of the 12 tribes. So the northern kingdom under King Jeroboam II was economically highly successful. They had trade in every direction and controlled the north-south and east-west trade routes. They had unparalleled financial success and lived in splendid luxury. But the leadership and the wealthy were greedy, materialistic, and corrupt. To do business, you needed to bribe someone. And to add insult to injury to God, they credited the false god Baal for their abundance and blessings and wallowed deliciously in their paganism. I think the Jeroboam II were a mighty warrior tribe and had extended its borders into Phoenicia, which is here, Lebanon today, and parts of Aram, which is Syria, over here. So the original Israel borders were just this piece. But you can see under Jeroboam II, they've extended way up into Syria. They also went across the uh, River Jordan into Ammon and Moab and took over that. So you can see they've substantially increased their land. Judah as well had increased because they didn't own Philistia, which was the Philistine land of the giants. But now they've taken it over and they've extended into Edom as well. So, uh, the Ephraimite, who were a mighty warrior tribe, had extended its borders into Phoenicia, which is Lebanon and parts of Aram, Syria, and they controlled pagan Moab and Ammon. Surrounding nations respected them and were their buffer on all sides from the Assyrian Empire. You can see the Assyrian Empire starting to encroach now and starting to come down this way. So this made them arrogant and overbearing, the fact that they were now buffered. They felt that when the Ephraimite king talked, both Israel and Judah and surrounding nations should all listen and take note. The north was a very powerful, self-important, egotistical kingdom. More than anything else, Amos' message was man's inhumanity to man, and that God holds people accountable for the injustice and oppression of others. While King Solomon outlawed human trafficking, the breakaway northern kingdom was making slaves of the destitute trafficking the needy, taxing the poor, and ritually and sexually using and abusing women. There were increased disparity between the wealthy and the poor. Amos was not one to mince words. Shaped by his rural life, he had a clear perspective of the evils that he witnessed and decried the North for their perversions. Additionally, Israel had become highly pagan, with their priests and leadership more interested in the money, the pomp, and the erotic temple prostitutes than God. They combined fervent paganism with a ritual worship of God. They only celebrated God's holy feasts and festivals because it meant a condoned wild party of drunkenness and debauchery. Their religion was self-pleasing with idolatry at its core. The North suffered from serious moral decay. 
Amos's message to the northern kingdom. But to Amos, the north was a foreign country. Yet Amos, whose name means burden or burden bearer or carried by God, was selected by God to be his messenger, to tell the north of their coming judgment. And for seven years, Amos faithfully shared the message that God entrusted him to deliver. While many others were afraid to speak up, Amos feared no one but God. And when denounced, Amos boldly replied, The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Amos prophesied within a 10-year period between 760 and 750 BC and mostly in Israel's capital, Samaria. And in Bethel, where the King Jeroboam had the first, had set up a golden calf for his man-made religion because he didn't want them traveling to Jerusalem, the north traveling to Jerusalem to worship. So he set up his little calf in Bethel and made his own man-made religion. So the north, wealthy and wallowing in idolatry, still held to the belief that they were God's chosen people and considered themselves immune to disaster. Amos set them straight. Israel did not welcome this uninvited prophet from the south. So Amos experienced significant pushback when he pointed out the north's perversions and degeneracy. Israel was happy to listen to Amos's initial prophecies because these judgments were against surrounding nations, their enemies. So they listened happily and nodded agreement. But almost 2,800 years ago, when Amos pronounced the same condemnation on their own kingdom for their own idolatry and depravity, Israel was shocked to be listed alongside her pagan neighbors. From the North's point of view, it was the best of times. From God's point of view, it was the worst of times. The North needed unparalleled repentance to please God. Amos, from start to end, was a prophet of doom, telling of God's impending harsh judgment. So the North ignored him. Yet barely 30 plus years later, in 722 BC, the Assyrian Empire invaded the northern kingdom, utterly destroyed its cities, and took all of its peoples captive. And the northern kingdom ceased to exist as an ethnic group. Wow. What happened to Amos? There are two versions of Amos's end. One is that eventually Amos was killed by Amaziah, a priest at Bethel where the golden calf was, who accused him of trying to overthrow King Jeroboam II by virtue of his prophecies. The other sources say Amos was not killed, but was strongly advised to return to Judah, basically kicked out of the northern kingdom. And this is the accepted version. So the layout of Amos illustrates his key idea, judgment comes. So a primary biblical principle is God judges sin. God is a holy God and he judges sin. A secondary biblical principle is God will stay his judgment if we truly repent and change our ways. So chapter 1, or 1a, is uh, the judgment on Israel neighbor of Aram, Syria, Philistia, Philistines, and Phoenicia, today's um, Lebanon. So these are the first three that I'm going to cover. So all the neighboring countries are Muslim countries. The first three nations are the pagan countries unrelated to Israel and Judah, Damascus, Syria, Philistines, and the Phoenicians. They are heathens and unrelated to Judah. But the next three nations are, are the cousins, Edom, Ammon, and Moab, and that will be in 1B, and they are cousins of Israel, same bloodline. So some of my slides are from Chuck Missler. Most of my slides, I love Chuck Missler slides. So let's ch dive into chapter 1, Woe to Israel's Neighbors. Notice that since Amos is prophesying doom on the north's heathen neighbors, the people are happy to listen to him. So verse 1, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep readers of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeremiah, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Sheep readers, God in his gracious mercy sent Israel a prophet to warn them. Amos evidently owned and bred large herds of sheep and goats. He also says in chapter 7 that he managed sycamore fig trees that did not grow in Tekoa, but only in warmer lowlands. And I found this on Google. This is what a sycamore fig tree looks like. I mean, it's absolutely huge. Uh, Tekoa. Which, this is an agricultural town in Judah, the southern kingdom, just 12 miles southeast of Jerusalem. 
the words which he saw concerning Israel. He saw the message as though he was reading from a heavenly scroll in a vision. So Isaiah king of Judah and Jeroboam king of Israel, Amos very clearly pinpoints his prophecies in the timeline of history. They had been peace for decades and an entire generation had grown up not knowing what war or hostilities were. Also, the civil war between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Judah, was long over. So there was relative peace between the two nations. Remember, after King Solomon died, the United uh, Kingdom of, uh, was broken up into the north and the south. Thus, there was no threat from internal strife and no external threat from surrounding nations. All was a false sense of calm. Two years before the earthquake, God shook the earth to shake up his people. This was an ominous portent or harbinger of worse things to come. It must have been a massive quake because Zechariah, some 250 years later, still wrote about it. Zechariah 14, And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Verse 2, And he said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. The Lord roars from Zion. The lion is the apex predator, and it roars before seizing its prey. This is a menacing start to Amos' message. In Hosea 5, God says, For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them and go away. I will take them, and no one shall rescue them. Only Yahweh is sovereign over all the earth. Here the lion is none other than God himself who really just wants to be Israel's shepherd. So he sent a sheep reader with his message. You know, of all of the books I've read, I love this line, where God himself, who really wants to be Israel's shepherd, so he sent a sheep reader with his message. Now, God always sends somebody relevant that the people can identify with. And Jesus, God just wants to be Israel's shepherd. I tell his voice from Jerusalem. The temple in Jerusalem is considered God's earthly home, and it is from where he speaks. When the Israelites left Egypt and got to Mount Sinai, there God entered into a covenant with them, not just with one individual, but with an entire nation. They swore an oath, a covenant to Almighty God. The Mosaic covenant was conditional on the people's performance to obey God's word. If they obeyed, God would give them the promised land and all his blessings. Exodus 19, God says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. If they disobeyed, God's curses would prevail. He would kick them out of the promised land into exile or even kill them off entirely. Amos was sent from Judah to tell the northern kingdom that they were seriously breaking the Mosaic covenant and judgment would follow if they did not the pastures of the shepherd mourn in the top of Carmel withers. Mount Carmel lies within the kingdom of Israel, and God's voice from Jerusalem in the south reaches to the north by way of his prophet Amos. From the driest regions to the greenest, the Lord's judgment will be a severe drought that devastates the land. From the grasslands to the lush slopes of Carmel and everything in between, all will suffer. The people and their livestock will die from a drought-induced famine because sin brings on the judgment of God. This is a biblical principle. Additionally, the Assyrians had a scorched earth policy and when they passed through conquered lands, they burned and destroyed everything in their path that might benefit the local inhabitants. So what the drought doesn't destroy, the Assyrians will. Verse 3, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they have threshed Gilead with implements of iron. Thus says the Lord. This is a term of promise. God's word is his promise. Hebrews 6, for when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. For three transgressions of Damascus, and for four. This X and X plus 1 is the Hebraic formula for stressing completeness, totality, and a climax. This expression is especially prevalent in Proverbs. If you read Proverbs, you'll see this X and X plus 1 happen a lot. 
Clearly, Amos is an educated and skillful writer. Amos believes all nations are subject to the morality of the one true God. He's unique in this aspect. He based his viewpoint on the law of Moses, which had been laid down 600 years before Amos and was thus long established. Everyone, Jews and Gentiles alike, must adhere to the single, common, divine law of God, which is natural law and is intrinsic to our human nature. We know by instinct right from wrong and evil from good. You just have to watch two-year-old toddlers fighting over a toy to know that the the one kid knows he's not supposed to steal it and the other toddler knows it's his and he wants it back. So there's very single, common, divine law, natural law. There's only one standard by which we are all judged. And the people of the northern kingdom were happy to listen to the demise of their enemy Syria as long as God ignored their own sins. So for now, these eight nations are judged, but later in the end times, all nations are judged. Joel 3 says, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. Matthew 25 About Jesus' second coming, he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on the left. And the sheep are the good guys going to heaven, goats are the bad guys going to hell. For transgressions of Damascus, Here Damascus is meant to include the entire region of Aram, what we call Syria today. The city itself existed 2000 BC, so that's 4000 years ago. It's the world's oldest continuously inhabited city on earth. Syria is also the furthest country away from Israel and a constant enemy. So the Israelites paid close attention to their threatened demise. I will not turn away from Aram's punishment. The transgressions of Damascus, I will not turn away from their punishment. Isaiah 17 said, Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. And today, large parts of Damascus, here's two soldiers, large parts of Damascus are a ruinous heap. It was also on the road to Damascus that the Pharisee Saul met Jesus and became the Apostle Paul, who then spread the gospel to the Gentiles. Gilead. Gilead was a Levitical city of refuge in the Old Testament. It's the region we call the Golan Heights today. The land of Gilead was known for its balm, a resin that dripped from certain trees such as pine, cedar, and cypress. Because of the easy access to medicinal ingredients, many physicians made their homes in Gilead. When the Promised Land was divided among the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribe of Gad received all the towns of Gilead. And in some passages of scripture, the terms Gilead and Gad are used interchangeably. Um, Syria had conquered Gilead. So Syria, way up there, had conquered Gilead 50 years before Amos. The Syrians under King Hazael plagued Israel, eventually capturing all of Gilead from Aror, which is down here on the Arnon River, to Bashan in the north. So later during the reign of King Joash of Judah, the southern, you know, Judah, uh, Hazael attacked Gath on the western border of Judah. So he came all the way from Assyria up here. He didn't come, he had already taken this land, but he didn't cross the, the river Jordan here. To get to Judah, he came this way through these the land. These are big mountains here of uh, the mountain range and the river Jordan. So he came this way over the lowlands to Gath, and the Syrian king Hazael attacked Gath on the western border of Judah. And Joash sent Hazael treasures from the temple of the Lord to persuade him from to withdraw from attacking Jerusalem. So this is like 30 miles away. So once he had taken Gath, he set his eyes on Jerusalem. So jo- King Joash paid him off with treasures from the temple. The Philistine city Gath figures prominently in the Old Testament. The 10-foot-tall giant Goliath lived there, and David conquered Gath, 
And when the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant as spoil in one of their many battles, first they took it to Ashdod, which was here on the on the coast. When they were struck with tumors, they moved it to Gath. And then eventually they, they put it on a cart with two cows and they just let it go and it walked itself all the way back into Israel, uh, into Judah. So, He's now God is angry with them because they threshed Gilead with implements of iron. So to separate the grain from the stalks, a man stood on a metal threshing sled pulled by oxen. So this is the sled. And the metal spikes beneath it effectively threshed or separated the wheat from the chaff. So here's these metal spikes underneath it. Hazael was a vicious tyrant who tortured his conquered Israelite prisoners with a metal threshing sled. So this is a picture I got. This is the underside of it here. I couldn't find one with the metal pieces sticking out of it like that. But this one you can see they have stuck raised. This is also a wooden sled. They stuck raised stones in it so that as they ride over the, the wheat lying on the ground, the, the stones will separate the uh, wheat from the chaff. So Hazael was vicious and he tied the people together and pulled the spiked sled over their bodies until they died. Can you imagine the horror of being tied down and they pull this metal, this sled with metal teeth over your body? Horrible. Isaiah 41, God says to Israel, Behold, I make of you a threshing sledge, new, sharp, and having teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and crush them. So when they did this to the Israelites, God said to Israel, Never mind, we'll do it back to them. So God will not tolerate unrighteousness, nor the inhumanity of men. Consequently, he would wipe Syria off the face of the earth. The people we call Syrians today are not true Syrians. There are other Arabs that moved into the land later. So he constantly wiped them off the face of the earth. Verse 4. But I will send a fire into the house of Hazael, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. A fire. God's judgment often included fire, usually in the form of cities set alight by the enemy. God warns he will destroy the house of Hazael and burn his palaces because of that, what they will inflict on Israel, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. So Ben-Hadad is a title much like president or pharaoh. There were three Ben-Hadads who ruled in Damascus, and the final one was murdered by Hazael, who then took the throne, this happy guy with the sledges. In 743 to 738, the Assyrian king, Tiglath Pileser III, attacked Syria and took them captive. Two kings for the king of Assyria went up against the massacres and took it, carried its people captive to Kerr, and killed Rezan, the king of Syria. So they got what they deserved. Verse 5, I will also break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter from Beth Eden. The people of Syria shall go captive to Kerr, says the Lord. I will break the gate bars. So remember these bars across the gates? This was a long piece of timber that was placed across the gate to lock it and keep intruders out. To break the bar implies forcibly entering a city to ransack it. God says he will destroy the security of Damascus, the Valley of Avon. Amos called it the Valley of Iniquity. Scholars think this valley is in Syria, 30 miles northwest of Damascus. So here's Syria, here's um, Damascus, so 30 miles northwest of Damascus. It was the heathen center of idolatry with many idols. It was also the garden spot of that region, and it was the summer residence of the Syrian kings. Captives to Kerr. Kerr, located in eastern Mesopotamia, was somewhere around the River Tigris. Here's the River Tigris. Kerr was the place from where the people of Aram originally migrated to Syria. There's a reason ancient people moved a long way away. Probably their long-term survival was in question. Just as God threatened to send the Israelites back to Egypt and bondage, so God says he will send the, the Aramites, the Syrians, back to Kerr and bondage. And the defeated Syrians were exiled to Kerr an Assyrian province on the banks of the river Kerr. So now this is the closest I could find looking through maps of the Old Testament biblical area was Kirkirk. So Kerr or Kirkirk. And so here's the river Tigris and here's the mountain range and all, and if you go, go close up in here, there's a billion little rivers and tributaries all feeding the Tigris 
coming from this mountain range, and Kirk is one of them. Uh, on the uh, is on one of these little rivers. So this could be what God was talking about when, he, or Amos prophesied when he said he'll send the captives to Kerr. Now, if you're in Kerr, and this is the Assyrian region, and you move from there, and you couldn't come this way because of the the desert, you had to migrate all this way across to get to Syria. So that's like a thousand twelve hundred miles. So if you move from there or anywhere along the Tigris all the way to Syria, your long-term survival was definitely in question. So they were getting as far away from the Assyrians as they could. And the defeated Syrians were exiled to Kerr, an Assyrian province on the banks of the river Kerr. So they landed up all the way back there as captives. So now we have judgment on Philistia, the land of the giants. So first we did Aram, Damascus, which was Israel, quite far away. And now we're on Philistia, which here, Dan, Ephraim, this, and Benjamin was part of Judah. So the border for Israel was like this. So here's Philistia right on their border. So verse 6, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they took captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. Transgressions of Gaza. Gaza represents the whole of Philistia. It was a very important city. Gaza guarded the entry to Canaan from Egypt and was along the major north-south trade route. So here's, Philist- here's Egypt, and if you were trading with, with Turkey or any of these other lands, you had to come up this way, and they guarded this, the, the land. And in fact, when Moses was at Kadesh Barnea and he sent the, the 12 spies into the land of Canaan, they came back via the Philistine and said, heck no, we're not going in there. Those guys, we were like the size of grasshoppers to them. So Philistia was very much a, a barrier. Uh, so if you wanted to trade, you were, you were including the Philistines. So it, got, it guarded the entry to Canaan from Egypt and was along the major north-south trade route. It was also the end point for the east-west trade route from Transjordan to the Mediterranean Sea. So all roads led to Gaza. So if you were on this side of the, this is the River Jordan down here. If you were on this side of the River Jordan and you wanted to get to the Mediterranean, the lower part, then you had to, you you landed up in Gaza. So here's Gaza here. So you're coming across, here's Gaza. There were the five major cities. So geographically, we're moving closer to Israel. Aram was far to the northeast, but Gaza is right in their neighborhood, south of the northern kingdom on the borders of both Judah and the north. Scholars believe that the Philistines were Spartans that relocated from the agency to Philistia around 1175 BC, where they preserved their own culture. Even their DNA was unique to the region. The Philistines were giants and very warlike. Ultimately, they were subjugated by the Assyrians, who were even more warlike, and later were taken into captivity by the Babylonians and vanished from history as a distinct group. So here's Judah. When the Babylonians took over Judah, while they were about it, they just took the Philistines at the same time. And so then the Philistines vanished from history as a distinct group. The Philistines warred against Israel and especially the tribe of Dan because Danites were highly skilled craftsmen with beautiful wares that the Philistines coveted. So this is the Philistines here, and here's Dan. Remember, they had the best, uh, they were highly skilled craftsmen. And obviously, they had stuff that the Philistines coveted, and so they were constantly raiding Dan. So eventually, Dan really got sick of it. So God raised up Samson, a Danite with size and enormous strength, to retaliate against the Philistines. But that, when Samson died, that was the end of that. So eventually, Dan said, you know, we've had enough, so they packed up all their stuff. And they moved way up here to the far side of the Israel, um, to, of the kingdom of Israel, right to the top there. They found a little town they liked, kicked out the inhabitants and moved in. Now, Samson lived 40 years from 1118 to 1074. And Joel was prophesying. Joel, one of the second minor prophets, was prophesying around 835 BC. So for nearly 300 years, from Samson until the days of Joel, the Philistines terrorized the north and the south the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. The Philistines were engaged in the repugnant slave trade. Not just warriors were captured in battle, but entire communities, men, women, and children, 
and they were traded like cattle into other countries. As the Philistines expanded their territory, they sold entire populations of captured people, likely from Judah and Israel, because here they are, here's Philistia, so they probably took them from Israel and Judah, to the Edomites who had a satanic hatred for all things Jewish. God said his universal penalty for slave trading was death. Exodus 21, God said, He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. Edom at this time in history was famous for its copper mining. Due to the horrific mining conditions, many slaves were needed to replace those dying constantly. Because they were just tiny holes that they were dug in the, in the, in the mountain and then you had to crawl in on all fours and, you know, horrific mining conditions. So, verse 7. But I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, which shall devour its palaces. Verse 8, I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod, and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. I will send a fire. So first he did one against Syria, verse 4, and now here in Gaza, he's going to also send fire in verse 7. So like Damascus, God will burn them out too. Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron. Yeah, he says, yeah. Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Ekron. The five principal cities of the Philistine confederations were Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath, which is not mentioned, but perhaps because it was already overrun. God had instructed the Israelites under Joshua to drive these heathen giants from the land, but they failed to do so, and they remained a thorn in the sight of Israel. So, Goliath was the, the famous Philistine, and Samson was the famous Dan- Danite, who was the same size as the Philistine. So the remnant of the Philistines shall perish. When the Assyrian Empire first invaded this area, the Philistine cities were given considerable autonomy in exchange for tribute, which they probably stole from the tribe of Dan. But after responding to various revolts by the Philistines, the Assyrian policy hardened. Eventually the giants were destroyed. They were utterly wiped out by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II in 604 BC. There's no Philistine remnant left today. None of their DNA. Judgment on Phoenicia, seafaring nations. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood for three transgressions of Tyre. Now that geographically, Amos is spiraling really close. So we've gotten the far away Syria. We've done the Philistines on the border, on the southern border of Israel. Now we have Phoenicia on the northern border. So he's talking about Tyre and the people of Israel were getting uncomfortable with this true prophet of God, as opposed to all their false prophets that were saying, everything's fine, God loves us, he'll never do that. Israel is no longer buffered from the enemy. Phoenicia is right on their northwest border. So uh, Tyre's economy, the city of Tyre, economy was based on fishing, shipbuilding, and commodities trading via their global shipping routes. And the griffin, Phoenicia's bird symbol, shows up engraved on walls all over the known world. And even in southern Africa, deep down into southern Africa, there's a fortification Um, that was built that actually has the griffin engraved into it. So even they got as far down as deep into southern Africa. So they were global traders, these guys. While Tyre originally didn't participate in slave trading, they did transport the slaves to the other countries. They did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. So under King Solomon, because the two nations, them and, and the Phoenicians, had no blood ties, The Israelites and the Phoenician king Hiram had a unique treaty, a covenant of brotherhood that forbade slavery and human trafficking of Jews specifically. Tyre was never to break this covenant. But after Solomon passed, Tyre conveniently forgot their covenant and treacherously took Hebrew captives and sold them to the hated Edomites. Even worse, the Phoenicians didn't take a few Jews here and there but sold entire conquered communities to nations in and around the Mediterranean, especially to the Greeks, who had at one time accumulated 1.4 million slaves. 
The Hebrews were educated to read, write, and count, and so were valuable to human traffickers. Isn't that shocking? Phoenicians' crimes were the same as the Philistines, slave trading entire Jewish communities. Notice that human trafficking were not isolated incidents, but habitual, perpetual criminal behavior. For three transgressions and four means they didn't do it once or twice, but they trafficked God's people all the time, and anyone else they could get their hands on. Verse 10. But I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre, the Phoenicians, which shall devour its palaces. Notice that God's judgment in each case is described in one word, fire. Syria, Philistines, and now the Phoenicians send a fire upon the wall of Tyre. The Philistines trafficked people, so God sentenced them to death. But the Phoenicians only transported the slaves primarily to Greece, and so were only sentenced to the destruction of their city. They seemed to get a lesser sentence because they transported them, whereas Philistines, the Philistines trafficked them. Strange that, isn't it? One would think the one was equivalent. Tyre was a coastal city, and off its mainland was an almost impregnable island, boastful of its security. So here's the mainland, and here's the island. The Lord says of Tyre in verse 21, Ezekiel 26, I will make you a terror, and you shall be no more. Though you are sought for, you will never be found again, says the Lord God. It took Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, 13 years to besiege Tyre, then completely destroy and enslave the people, and 30,000 were carried off in slavery. So this is the current city of Tyre, what it looks like, not much left of it, which shall devour its palaces. A remnant escaped to an island half a mile offshore where they survived for 240 years. So it was pretty impregnable. Plus, of course, they were the seagoing nation. So they, you know, they probably had a navy. Then Alexander the Great, a Greek, built a causeway from the mainland to the island. And he used the buildings and palaces of Tyre to build his causeway. And 241 years after the Babylonians, he captured the island in 332 BC. So the Babylonians took the mainland and Alexander the Greek took the island. The entire people were carried into slavery by Greeks. So here they transported the slaves to Greece and now the entire people they carried into slavery by Greeks. How's that for irony? Huh. So this is the end of the three Arab nations that are enemies of Israel unrelated by blood, which is Syria, the Philistines, and the Phoenicians. So it's uh, Aram, Damascus, Syria, the Philistines down here, and the Phoenicians up there. They were um, unrelated by blood. They were enemies of Israel, unrelated by blood. Now next in chapter 1b um, is the Amos tackles the enemies of Israel that are their cousins. They're their own bloodline, and so that I'll do that in chapter 1b. So then they are the Ammon, Moab, and Edom. So, so these tribes are the cousins of Israel. Here's Israel. So this is the end of episode 2, chapter 1a, Israel's neighbors, Judge, Syria, Philistine, and Phoenicia, which are these three here. God is our judge for good and evil. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 5.10 So before you go, let me bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Please follow me to episode 3. God bless you. God bless you. Shalom.